Well, thank you all, um, thank you all very much indeed for um, coming this evening. Um, I'm Paul Johnson, Director of the uh, IFS, and I'm, I'm delighted to be chairing this, um, I can't remember, this must be, uh, we've had a large number of these events now with CIOT over the last um, four or five years, um, and it turns out that this is a very good moment uh, to be having this particular discussion, since uh, at this point in the election campaign, business tax appears to be the, this appears to be the day for business tax announcements, certainly by the, uh, by the Conservatives who um, have offered a few um, goodies to the business community this morning and then taken, a, taken a rather more away with the, um, uh, the increase or the lack of decrease in the headline corporation tax rate uh, coming down the road, which um, gives them a bit more money to play with. The Labour Party, of course, have got their own um, exciting uh, plans for the business community over the next um, over the next few years. Um, they haven't. I don't think I've heard any of them say anything very specific about digital services tax. Um, probably not the most exciting thing in an election campaign, other than to the audience here today. Um, so I'm glad that we've got um, four uh, experts on this to talk to us uh, this evening. The idea is that this is about half the allotted time. Um, the four people you see before you um, downloading their expertise and the other half um, uh, you having a chance to question them. Um, I won't read out their um, CVs, you've got small biographies in front of you. I think you can see from those if you don't know, uh, if you don't know the speakers already that these are uh, possibly the four best speakers we could have on this particular, on this particular issue. Um, they're all laughing and looking like a man for saying, for saying that. Um, uh, but that's what they told me. <laughs> um, they're each going to speak for um, 10 minutes or so. Uh, and at the end, as I said, time for questions. Actually, this is all being recorded. Um, so when it comes to question time, uh, what you say uh, will be recorded and broadcast. So please take that, uh, keep that in mind uh, when you are asking the questions and perhaps all members of the panel can bear that in mind as they make their remarks. Um, let's kick off then uh, with Glyn Fulwell, President of the CIOT. Glyn, if you could spend um, 10 minutes or so, I think you're going to give us a little bit of a sort of history of where we are and how we got here. Yes, indeed. Um, we were hoping to have someone from government, from Treasury tonight, but for obvious reasons they couldn't make it, so I'm the substitute, so I'm definitely not one of the best speakers. If my phone makes an embarrassing noise, it's because I've put a timer on to tell me when to shut up. So if it makes an embarrassing noise, I've gone on for too long. So this, I'll give you a little bit of the, hopefully, the history and the policy background. It will be rather UK-centric. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me for that. And about... So 10 or so years ago, the May, uh, there was a lot of corporate tax avoidance going on in the UK. I think we can say that without too much fear of a contradiction. And HMRC was actually doing quite a reasonable job of combating that through the courts, but was also trying to draw this to public attention, possibly slightly less um, successfully because pre-financial crash when everyone was making a lot of money it didn't seem to matter too much. Um, once the financial crash happened though and, and we hit an age of austerity um, the narrative that HMRC had created around tax, this very real culture of tax avoidance uh, was picked up. Actually ironically at a time when for reasons I'm not going to go into that classical type of tax avoidance where you, you do something that the, the tax authority really disagrees with was actually sort of falling away a lot. So, and what, that, what was picked up was the, and started to be examined quite closely were other techniques that large companies, particularly multinational companies, were re using to reduce their profits People will remember the first of these that really came to attention in the UK was Starbucks. And what it was then quickly noticed that other large, particularly US multinational companies, and particularly those in the digital sector, were paying very low amounts of corporation tax, not only in the UK, but also on their profits worldwide. And it was 
identified that what they were doing was using flaws or using differences in national tax systems to arbitrage tax um, opportunities, to arbitrage their tax liabilities, and to reduce them, and where possible, eliminate them. Um, so this was noticed not only in the UK, but also elsewhere in Europe in particular. Um, and it was given a name. It was given the name Base Erosion and Profit Shifting, which, as it suggests, is what was being done was the tax base was being eroded and profits were being shifted to where they were taxed at either very low rates or no rates. And in this way, multinationals were reducing their tax liabilities. And in, in an age of austerity, the ability to do that when ordinary taxpayers and other businesses couldn't do that seemed extremely unfair. So, the G20 uh, gave the job to the OECD of trying to resolve this and come up with a better system. Now, two questions might have been asked at that point. Um, one was, um, how do we stop base erosion? And the other question was, is the base right? Should we have a different base that's not so easily eroded? And actually, that had been called for by some countries such as China and India for some time because they felt the existing system was too biased towards where you controlled your production, you controlled your risks, you held your intangible property, that's where the bulk of the profits got taxed and it was biased against countries where sales were made. However, the first question that was actually posed to the OECD was more along the lines of, we've noticed that um, big American multinational digital companies are particularly good at this. Is this base erosion and profit shifting really a function of digitalization? And is the issue really uh, the digital economy? Uh, the OECD uh, came back with the answer, no, they're just very good at it. And then they spent the next two or three years seeking ways of eliminating those techniques that were being used to erode the base. And actually, I think we can say they did a pretty good job. There are still some tidying up bits which Richard might want to, might want to mention. But we are, you know, we are in sight of, I believe, a situation where you could argue that multinationals are paying tax somewhere on all of their profits. So that base has been pretty much shored up. But standing back from it for a moment, if you are looking to erode a base, a tax base, and reduce your tax liabilities, what do you do? You erode your largest tax bases where you're paying the most tax. And if you're a US company, where are you likely to pay your, have most of your profits and otherwise pay most of your tax? It's in the US. So what was the single most, single most likely outcome of BEPS, the BEPS project, the successful BEPS project, it was that US companies would pay more tax in the US. And as this emerged as the reality, so European countries and European governments began to feel a little bit uncomfortable, and they said, well, these, com these companies are still having a very, they feel like an integral part of our economies, they are here, they are, um, you know, our, our, our citizens are using them. And for goodness sake, Amazon's even made a Christmas ad this year. So, you know, so, um, but they're not paying the same amount of tax as, um, as local businesses. So something is still wrong. So there was pressure to change the system again, to have further changes, pushed it back to the OECD. And again, Richard can talk about where they're coming from in terms of their... Um, latest thoughts, but uh, this and, and these later changes are actually more about we want some more tax. <coughs> okay, the base may have been shored up. We actually want a little bit more of that base. And in order to encourage the OECD to reach um, some conclusions, and probably also to include uh, to encourage countries such as the U.S., which are likely to be losers in this type of reallocation project 
to participate, unilateral measures started to be introduced, and that's where digital services taxes come in, and that's what some other members of the panel will be talking about later. So we've moved from a, quest, we've moved from a point where people are talking about if like tax avoidance to who has the taxing rights? Who has the ability to tax the profits that these large multinational companies are making? And I think I'll just... Um, I, I, won't, you know, I think one of the... Um, well, I'll just have one comment from one of Richard's... Uh, uh, colleagues, which is uh, Pascal saint amand has said that um, in recent years, Europe, European countries started sounding like China and India of, of days gone past, that, yes, the base is not right, we want more of the base. Um, the other thing that I think probably today we should mention is the recent Labour Party proposals, because whilst um, DSTs and the, the current OECD proposals, which Richard's going to talk about, I'm sure, reallocate part of the worldwide corporate tax base to consumer nations. What the Labour Party has proposed in recent days is to take the whole of the profits, the whole cake, not part of the cake, and reallocate that on a formulary basis. <coughs> Uh, based on sales and employees and maybe one or two other factors. That is a considerably greater reform or a considerably <coughs> greater step along this road than what is being done by a DST or being proposed by the OECD at the moment. And um, it will, uh, enacted unilaterally, would have, I would say, some challenges. But I'm not going to uh, go any further in, uh, in my comments on that. So I think hopefully that's set the scene for the others to expand on and I will stop there Thank without you. triggering my... Um, Brilliantly done and the other panellists can uh, take, a, take a lesson from that. <laughs> can, I, can I ask you a yeah. question at, at the end of that? I mean, what, the, the very strong sense that you gave from that was, was, was not that we are now in a world where these big digital companies are paying too little tax, it's really we're, we're entirely in a world where we're talking about how we distribute that across the nations in which they I, work and produce. Is that, is that a fair a sort of summary? I, will, no. I think we're getting to the point where you could say that, but I think there are some proposals still to be come out to the OECD, in fact, to finalise that. But I think that world is in sight. Of course, whether they're paying too little or not is actually also a question of how much you think they should be paying. Uh, I think to how much tax you think you should be taking out of them at the corporate, the corporate level. I think if, although if you're saying, are they paying the tax in accordance with the countries in which they operate and the tax rates in those countries, close to it, although some of the proposals at the moment would actually and in my view, enable country, companies that derive their profits from intangibles still to pay considerably lower rates than companies that don't. But that's possibly beyond the scope, certainly beyond the scope of the introduction. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, we now move on to Richard Collier, who has got an extraordinary career in, um, in law and accountancy and academia and, um, uh, and now at the at the OECD, and I, I guess, Richard, you're going to tell us something about where the OECD currently is. I, I am indeed. If you follow the OECD work in progress on digitalisation, you won't be surprised to hear that I'm not here tonight to support the case for DSTs. The OECD is obviously working on a different approach, and I'll return to that below. However, having said that, I, I do want to make the point that it's not particularly surprising that we do have these DST proposals. And I do think that they need to be considered in the context of a number of prevailing tax tensions in the system, uh, rather than in isolation, as they sometimes are. In other words, what I'm saying is that we need to recognise the challenges which have given rise to the DSTs. Now, though there are, no, there are a number of very big challenges, uh, I'm just going to mention four or five of them briefly. Uh, they include, and I'd start my list with, the concern that the current tax system 
is not working because it's been outpaced by, I mean, made inadequate by globalization. So that involves all the, all the issues of digitalization, including uh, this, this notion that uh, uh, Paul's just introduced about large digital, digital companies and others being seen as not paying their fair share yet making, uh, of, of taxes, yet making huge profits. Uh, and an important aspect of this is the view that the state of, or of the market or the user does have a right to tax in certain cases. That would be illustrated in a UK perspective uh, by reference to the contribution of value made by the user, or in a US perspective uh, by the location of the marketing intangible. And then there's also an India uh, side, India perspective that's quite, quite different altogether, which is on the inadequacy of any supply side analysis. Another concern is that uh, the unprecedented BEPS project has not succeeded in dealing with cases of abuse. That arguably explains why Pillar 2 is part of the overall package. Then there's the concern about the dissatisfaction of some states with the fundamental allocation of taxing rights, a theme that's already been raised. That, for example, is reflected in the war of attrition that you sometimes see relating to transfer pricing matters, arguments about PE threshold that seem to span the world. Uh, there are also concerns that the basic income allocation system based on the ALP is in, in some respects ineffective. Too easy to manipulate. Um, some people take the view that it's completely silly to base uh, an income allocation system on separate legal entities in a group when the group itself obviously operates as an economic unit. And there are varying uh, uh, in, uh, responses to those uh, tensions from replacing it entirely for example, as represented by the uh, destination-based cash flow tax or as some formulary approach and, and so on. Uh, so from those sort of approaches which are wholesale reform through to targeted remediation. And most fundamentally in this context, it seems to me that another tension that we need to take account of is the uncertainty about the limits of what can and should or could be achieved on a multilateral basis rather than on a unilateral basis. That issue, it seems to me, raises profound issues about the course of multilateral tax reform, including treaties, and what's possible. So that, that is the context that I think we should look at, uh, uh, in which we should look at DSTs. Uh, it, in the light of the comments I've made, uh, it seems no surprise at all that we see developments of DSTs. Now, I did have one of my team uh, try and uh, pull out some kind of analysis of DSTs. I have a little matrix here. Uh, I, sh I should have copied it and handed it around. I do apologize. Uh, but what it tells me is that in, uh, and this is broken down into those DSTs that have been discussed uh, in one box, announced or proposed in the next, adopted in the next, or effective and in force in the next. What this tells me is that we have 15 territories in Europe that span discussed, announced or proposed, adopted or enforced. The number for Asia is seven, two in Africa and uh, two in the Americas, Canada and Chile, if you're interested. Uh, so we have some uh, 25 or so, actually 26 states, and by the way, the analysis does turn on how you interpret various measures within jurisdiction, so I'm not claiming this is the uh, Old Testament version of truth. This is a sort of an approximation of uh, what's going on in terms of DST developments. Um, and uh, this is the direction we're going. We've already seen the skirmish between the US and France, which is not concluded but deferred. And I think it's, it's pretty clear we're going to see a lot more of this potentially in the future. Uh, now let me turn to uh, what the OECD is doing about this. Um, the OECD and the Inclusive Framework is engaged on an alternative path. Uh, that involves some pretty significant changes, or proposed changes. The Pillar 1 project itself and its ambition is attempting the biggest change to inter the international tax system in 100 years. Uh, part of the approach is to in introduce a new group approach to the uh, allocation of income to replace in part or overlay on top of the single legal entity perspective for a new taxing right. 
there is a, new, a completely new basis for the existence of that new taxing right based on market or user jurisdiction, not the tr traditional supply side analysis we see in the ALP. I've given you three interpretations of what that means. If you remember my comments about the US and the UK and say in India, how they would see that, they would all see that in slightly different ways. But what's clear is that a common theme is that there is a recognition of a new taxing right in the market or user jurisdiction. Another major feature and a departure of this is a heavy reliance on the formulary approach. And there is also uh, part of the package an attempted overhaul of existing bilateral dispute mechanisms. In other words, the, uh, they tend to be bilateral uh, retrospective mechanisms that try and resolve disputes on the one hand. Another feature of the package is the attempt to get a effective certainty uh, process in place, which would uh, correspond to something that might be thought of more as a multilateral, prospective approach for this new taxing right that's being created. Uh, and then the process of the systemic reform is being driven by the 130 state inclusive framework rather than the 35 odd OECD member states. Uh, now any one of these various points that I've just made uh, would be a significant departure in itself. Uh, but all six of these points are being driven by the tax tensions in the international system. And it's impossible not to see the scale of the issues raised by those tax tensions, which obviously also includes uh, DSTs. Now that recognition of the scale of what's being raised is reflected in some of the difficulties that are inherent in the, in the work the OECD is doing. What the OECD is trying to do is build a completely new infrastructure for a new taxing right, involving, for example, the use of consolidated accounts in a way that they've never been used before, uh, looking at how we could do business line segmentation, etc. There are a number of infrastructure requirements to deliver this new taxing right. Then we've got the task of integrating the new taxing right, the new out income allocation system, with the existing system. Now that's obviously needed because the ALP already taxes 100% of the income of a multinational group. So if we are creating a new taxing right, we obviously need to find a way of integrating the two systems so that we end up not taxing more than 100%. And that's achieved through the elimination of double tax mechanism. We're trying to solve, or we have to solve, a number of entirely novel and difficult problems. Uh, I've mentioned the elimination of double tax at the junction of the group approach and the existing uh, system approach. And if that weren't all enough, we have the little matter of getting everybody to agree to it, winners and losers together, to agree in a consensus approach. I can't overestimate the scale of these challenges. I think they're pretty obvious to everybody. Uh, but they are what is involved in the alternative route to the DSTs. Uh, namely, the inclusive framework of OECD efforts to get a unified approach signed up to by all. Uh, and the proposition is that DSTs would give way to this reform, but obviously that means it has to be successfully implemented. So, in conclusion, the, what, the points I'm trying to make here is that we cannot just see the DSTs in isolation. Uh, it, it seems to me very easy to just criticise the DST as a standalone <coughs> isolation thing. Uh, they need to be considered in the context of the existing tax tensions in the system, and those tax tensions are real and are driving significant tax reform at a number of levels, and I think there's no chance of them going away. The hope at the OECD and, and the delegates of the inclusive framework is that the current attempt at major international reform within the bounds of what may attract uh, the required consensus support represents a clearly preferable way of proceeding and is the best shot of bringing stability to the international tax system. But as I've tried to make clear, that brings with it its own set of challenges and trade-offs, uh, as you'll see from my comments. Now, in the absence of an OECD, or Inclusive Framework Approach, I am actually quite sceptical that the 25-plus states, will probably be to 35 or more by, by the time we get to this stage, will, uh, that have them, or are proposing them, or thinking about them, will magically see the error of their ways and put them away. I think the view of 98% of the people I speak to, uh, rather, is that the next stop would be tax wars, retaliation and counter-retaliation, 
potentially bringing chaos to the international tax system. So the main point I'm making is that if you do not like DSTs, you are in the real world going to need an alternative approach. Now, it is election season. I hope you've been interested by, by my comments canvassing support for the approach of the Inclusive Framework and OECD Party as just such an alternative approach. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Well, it, um, it being election season, I mean, the obvious, um, the obvious question to ask the, uh, the person making the promise is, 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 is when, when do you think you can deliver? I mean, what's your, um, <laughs> what's your, what, what's your best case scenario for, um, uh, for, 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 for making progress? Uh, well, it's the uh, uh, it's a matter of public record that we're going to be making progress in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> the politician is here. <laughs> um, right, we next move on to um, Ali Kennedy, who is um, working in the, um, the the tech industry as vice president uh, for tax at um, at Sophos. So, Ali, I think you. Some interesting things to say on this as well. Um, well, I suppose what, what I'll attempt to do is try and distill the business view on this. Um, and normally, when businesses and heads of tax talk to each other about any piece of new legislation, we're all coming at it from a different direction. You know, we're, we're all completely focused on our own organisation, winners and losers. But it's safe to say on DST we all reached consensus incredibly quickly. Um, and the consensus is around, please don't do it, let the OECD do their job. Um, and certainly in the UK we feel that the tolerance of the business community has been somewhat stretched in the last three years. Um, we, we all know why. And really, to, to go down the route of a DST at, at this stage is really something that we could do without. And uh, I would say the business community are, are supportive of what the OECD is doing. Um, there are different views on how they should achieve it, but there is a lot of consensus around the fact that we really should not be going around the, um, the DST route in the UK at this time. So I spoke to other heads of tax and I actually started speaking to some of the accountants and the systems people who will have to operate in this environment and will have to deliver it just to get their thoughts. Um, I, and then, as I say, it was, a, it was a relatively simple concept to explain to them for once and it, it was quite interesting seeing some of their reactions. So the UK DST feels like a unique and novel tax. Um, I think it, you know, it, it I haven't looked at all of Richard's 15 other ones, but you know they, they're all a bit different. So the first challenge we have in business in the UK is that we will have to decide whether we, we carry out digital service activity. And in doing that, we'll be looking at legislation that we have never had to apply before. There's no precedent and companies will very quickly have to get to grips with whether they are in or out of the tax and we don't feel that that is particularly straightforward. Um, and if we decide that we are in or, or possibly in, the next challenge for us is to identify the revenue streams that would be taxed and the business often will have absolutely no other reason to record that or will not have recorded it, particularly if you have a highly integrated business model, you might actually never have looked at those particular revenue streams and you might not have systems set up to identify them. Um, so we're looking again at a temporary tax, allegedly, um, where we have no records or may have no records and we'll have to go to a fair bit of work to figure out are we in the system, um, how do we identify the revenue streams and you know how do we then identify what is potentially attributable to the UK or UK users. So this doesn't chime well with us when we understand that in the UK and to quote we're, propo we're proposing to have greater stability, predictability and simplicity in our tax system. Um, 
I was at a business conference today where all three party leaders were standing speaking and um, Johnson stood up and said there is a pent up tidal wave of investment waiting to come into the UK. Well, if the UK are alienating the technology industry, I think he could have got that wrong because what we are seeing at the moment is a rush of tech companies who are working out how they can get out of the UK because it's not entirely the most business friendly environment at the moment, which is a pity because the UK is a great place for technology. We have great skills, universities, um, and huge talent in the UK and, and it feels like with everything else going on we should be nurturing our technology companies and our technology offering um, and hoping to have that type of wave of investment not actually alienating anyone. So, so going back to the tax and, and how we would actually um, work with the tax, we, we were quite pleased to see that it wasn't going to come into the SAO regime. Um, but then on further examination, we would be required to sign off that our declarations were correct and complete. So, if you have a brand new tax um, with a high degree of judgment as to which revenue streams are caught, where your users are, um, what in integrated models it will apply to, Having to sign off that something is correct and complete is a bit of a challenge. And in the same legislation, the words just and reasonable basis come in. So correct and complete and just and reasonable, if, if someone can explain to me how you merge all that together or, or you can explain to your accountants and your senior accounting officer, um, that would be great. Um, our experience of working with HMRC, particularly around research and development, is that there is not a high degree of skill in understanding technology companies and technology business models. So one thing that we could all lobby for, which I think would be very helpful, is if not training for CCMs in this, at least having some sort of central team at HMRC who could handle this, and I suspect the CCMs would be quite grateful for that as well. Um, and certainly things like clearance mechanisms to know if you're in or out or a clearance mechanism to say is your methodology appropriate before you sign something saying it's correct and complete um, would all be very useful as would dispute resolution mechanisms if you know with this high degree of judgment that's involved we come to a different conclusion from HMRC or we find that the, the same um, tax is being sought by DST regimes in more than one country even, which is perfectly possible that, that, it, that it will be when there are several sides to a transaction. So we are expecting to see increased costs in designing accounting systems that are going to gather the data and are going to report the data. I don't know if any of you have actually reconfigured an SAP or Oracle system at any time, but it's a bit like turning an oil tanker. It takes a very long time to do it and a lot of thought has to go into it before you do it. So we're expecting increased costs, but it's quite interesting if you go on HMRC's website and read about the digital services tax, it says the impact will include some one-off costs of familiarisation with the new rules and ongoing costs of keeping the records, the overall impact in business is expected to be negligible. <laughs> and then HMRC go on to say, however, HMRC will incur costs of up to 8 million to enable new IT systems and processes to be developed and staff to be trained. So, um, if anyone in HMRC would, would like to come and succumb to us while we make a change to an ERP system, then I'd be very happy to have them and they can explain why the cost to me would be negligible, but um, that wouldn't be where I was coming from. So, um, given all of that and the temporary nature of this tax, do we feel that what the UK are asking business to do is proportionate? If they say that the DST will go as soon as the OECD um, complete their work or, or there is an advanced proposal to look at next year, 
um, is it proportionate to expect business to do all of this work for a time-free tax? Um, the other interesting aspect of it is the fact that you need to know where your users are. Um, and certainly some surveys have been done, and the one I saw most recently said that 61% of in-scope businesses don't actually track um, or split advertising revenues by user location, um, and, and some wouldn't actually know how to. And coming from a cybersecurity background, I would absolutely agree with that, because I would challenge anyone to track me if I didn't want to be tracked. Um, on the three devices that I have on me tonight, absolutely none of them will tell you that I'm in the UK if I happen to go on Facebook. So we are increasingly in a world where you can only track users who wish to be tracked. If a user does not wish to be tracked, it's impossible. Um, so at the end of the day, um, you're asking companies probably to guess or give it their best guess, um, or we call it using judgment as to where their users are, and we're basing a tax system on that. So I would suggest that it's a huge amount of work. We're going to have disputes. Um, business does not really feel that, that this is the right time for the UK to do this with everything else that's going on. Um, but I suspect over the next few months um, that we will see this happen. Certainly from the political leaders today on the tax announcements that they made, there was no indication that the appetite for this had lessened. So um, I think what we'll be looking at now is sort of getting into the nitty gritty and trying to iron out the glitches rather than looking at, at the high level principles of this tax for now. So it sounds a bit depressing, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's appropriate for the moment. We all know, of course, that these are entirely victimless taxes as far as um, politicians are concerned. But let's ask one thing. You referred to, to all of the complexities in, in, involved with the DST. Is, is the objection that, that they wouldn't be involved with the sorts of things OEC are proposing, or is it or, or, or is the view that, yes, they would, and perhaps even more, but that, that's, that's worth having because we can get something stable across the world and it will be the same for all uh, for, for companies in, in different, different jurisdictions? I think businesses feel that if you're going to tax profit and tax profit once, that's an admirable objective and you're willing to work very hard towards achieving that. The, the DST just causes a, a degree of chaos and double taxation for business that um, it, it feels less worthwhile to work with all of these individual jurisdictions who are taking in national action to try and iron out all of the issues. Um, I think there are a lot of challenges around the, the, the Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 proposals, but you feel you could perhaps make a better attempt at, at working through these, and it might be more worthwhile, at least if you had some consistency across the globe. I know that a lot of us fed into the DST um, consultation and we were all left feeling afterwards that all of the business comments had been largely ignored and, and it's one of the few consultations where we've walked away and felt like that because I think we've always felt that progress has been made in many other consultations that we've done but um, this one just feels like a, a lot of work um, for something that is inevitably not going to work very well. But, uh, more cheerfulness. Um... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, we'll now move on to um, Mike Devera, who uh, most of you know is the director of the Oxford University Centre for Business Taxation and the sort of the, the godfather of the economics of corporate tax in the UK. I think. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, that's probably John Kay who's in the back of the room, actually. Um, so, uh, thanks. So, I have students, and my students uh, like slides, so I've done some slides for you. And you're not my students, but I, I can't stop myself. Um, so, um, Let's start with why. So why are there proposals for the DST? I think this has come up already, but um, I just wanted to highlight this. So the first thing is, you know, what the Treasury says is this measure is not expected to have any significant macroeconomic impacts. So I think you know, we could have made a case for um, a DST or some kind of tax on some digital companies on kind of competition grounds, and I think people have made that case in the past. Uh, you know, if, Amazon gets an advantage over the local bookseller, then you know maybe we should have a tax on Amazon to kind of try and correct that 
uh, competition problem. That's not the rationale that the Treasury has put forward. So we just want to get that one out of the way. So, um, so it's about. I think it's about revenue, um, and there's. I think there's two ways of looking at that. And I, I'm, I think I broadly agree with Glyn. You know, we have had a number of years where we've been thinking about base erosion, profit shifting. You know, are companies paying enough tax broadly and generally across the world? Uh, that's one question. The other question is, uh, are they paying it here as opposed to somewhere else? And I think we are kind of broadly now much more on the second of those and on the first of those. Um, we are in already, as, as Richard referred to, a kind of tax war. Uh, is the problem just digital? Well, we've done work in the Centre for Business Taxation looking at um, the tax returns of all UK companies, because we have access to that. It's all anonymised, so we can't see individual companies. But if you look at the group of uh, UK subsidiaries of foreign multinationals, uh, over the period that we're looking at, which I think ended in about 2015, so it's slightly out of date, 60% of all of those observations, so company years, uh, had zero tax. So uh, there's a lot of non-payment of tax by uh, subsidiaries of foreign multinationals in the UK, certainly not just digital companies. You know, there may be lots of good reasons for that. I'm not saying it's all, that it's all profit shifting, but you know, there's, there's certainly an issue. So. Um, what are we trying to do? I, I like to call this the Sutton tax. I've used this joke before, but you know, if there's a good joke, I might as well use it more than once. Um, so Sutton is Willie Sutton, uh, the American bank robber, who asked, uh, why do you rob banks? He said, that's where the money is. Um, so uh, I think that's pretty much uh, where we are now. These are the kind of biggest companies in the world, and they're extremely profitable. So uh, why tax in the UK? Well, I think we have uh, a choice of reasons here. So, um, if you uh, believe the Treasury, then we want to tax them in the UK because they've created value here. And I have something to say about that. Um, the, other, the other possibility is that we can. They are here. Uh, in a sense, they can't move away because if they want to provide services to users in the UK, those users are all here. If anybody wants to you know, make a Google search, it's unlikely that you're going to go to a different country in order to do that. And so uh, Google is in some sense located here. You know, if that provides a nexus, that means we can tax it. I would really want to distinguish these two as a matter of, it's, it's really, it is a matter of principle, but it has some quite important implications, I think. Um, so let's see what the Treasury's position is. So the Treasury said uh, in its most recent consultation document, November 2018, the international tax framework is underpinned by the principle that the profit of a multinational group should be taxed in the countries in which it creates value, and the UK continues to support that position. So, I don't know how many people in the room would accept that as a proposition. Um, it seems to me we're in the world of alternative facts. Um, so, taxing where value is created, um, it's simply not the basis of the current system. There are lots of ways in which uh, businesses are taxed, which has nothing to do with the where, where the value is created. All of passive income, payment of interest, royalties, that's generally taxed in the place where it's received, not in the place where value is created. It's actually hard, pretty hard to define what we mean by value created, which is actually my next point, has no intellectual coherence because, you know, we could spend at least the next hour trying to figure out where value is created. But let me give you an, an example or two. Suppose um, I'm producing shirts in the UK and I decided that actually I could um, produce them more cheaply by outsourcing my production to Bangladesh. So I make more profit. Where have I, where have I created the additional value? Bangladesh. Bangladesh. I'd say Bangladesh. Okay, so do we tax in Bangladesh? We don't tax that in Bangladesh. So the profit doesn't arise in Bangladesh. The profit is likely to arise here. Um, the examples I was giving last year were the England football team playing in Russia. As, you know, as they got more and more successful, people bought more and more beer. We can imagine the price of beer went up as well. Pubs were making more and more profit. Where was that value created? Well, that value is created in Russia as Harry Kane scored more and more goals and the excitement got greater and greater. So um, I just leave it to those two, but I'm sure we can think of many more examples like that. Um, so I think that my next point, this would be the worst possible way to allocate taxing rights. I, that's a bit of a strong claim. I mean, maybe we could think of something worse, but um, <laughs> I'm not sure that I've thought of one yet. And finally, um, I'd like to say this is actually been disavowed by Pascal Sandman in private, but also in public in the Royal Festival Hall in front of 
thousands of people at the IFA Congress just a couple of weeks, uh, a couple of months ago. He, um, so he, what he, well, I think where this came from is, you know, in the BEPS process, what we can all agree is that Google doesn't make its profits in Bermuda, uh, as an example. Um, that's fine, and there's no value being created in Bermuda, and you know, that's fine. As a principle, if we say there's actually nothing going on there, we shouldn't be taxing them there. That seems, that seems broadly okay. But to take that principle and then kind of extend it in the way that the Treasury is now claiming that it wants to, um, seems to me to kind of pushing this uh, principle way beyond anything that we could possibly use. Um, so where does that leave us with the DST? I think, you know, the, we have problems with the DST, it's based on revenue, it's not based on profit at all. So as a profits tax starts off with a kind of not very good base because we don't give relief for costs. Um, secondly, we're arbitrary ring fencing this group. You now we have to decide, as, as Ali was saying, you know, so who's in and who's out. So that's clearly a huge problem. Um, but we also, um, we're going to create distortions due to the kind of limited nature of what the, the DST is uh, trying to get at within the UK. So what, what in its set out to get is social media platforms, internet search engines, online marketplaces. So the Treasury would like to tax uh, a marketplace. So if I'm trying to sell something on eBay and Paul wants to buy it, eBay is making some profit, and that's an independent marketplace, that's, that's, that's something... You know, there's some data there which you know, eBay is collecting and that's valuable and they want to tax it. Uh, if, if Amazon, let's say, I mean, if Amazon is selling something to Paul directly, then that's not in, in the DST. So there's a big difference here between, you know, being a marketplace and actually selling directly. Um, and, the, you know, the grounds are apparently uh, that it's to do with where value is created. Um, and finally, um, the Prime Minister uh, raised more money uh, this afternoon by a factor of 10 than the DST would raise. So by increasing the corporation tax rate by <coughs> two percentage points relative to what it would have been, you know, that's going to raise something of the order of five to six billion, which is more than 10 times more than the DST would raise. So, I mean, if we really want to raise some more money, we've already done it. You know, <laughs> we <laughs> always uh, want more. <laughs> we, we might want more, so we can raise a little bit more. And, um, then we, uh, so that's the kind of that's the kind of comments on the DST. I just want to set that into the kind of broader context and also what the OECD is doing. Um, and um, so I actually gave a talk, uh, the IFS COT um, presentation a few years back, I think it's 2013, where I put up this chart and said, well, here's a picture of a multinational company. Let's kind of think afresh about where we might want to tax the profit that it generates. Um, I would say this, I think this is 2013, and I also announced um, that at the time I was setting up a new committee to think about this, and we'd be reporting back. I'm glad to say that actually we're still about to report back, but we're very close now. We're actually submitting um, a manuscript of our book to OUP, uh, like any day now, I hope, and it will be out next year, but I can tell you some of the stuff that's in it. So where do we, so the question is where do we tax now, where ought we to tax? Uh, where do we tax now? Um, well, mostly here, where they, I call it affiliates, you know, this is where subsidiaries, permanent establishments, all kind of things are kind of broadly of, the, of multinationals are. There's all kind of ways in which we tax them there. We might tax them there because they received a royalty, because they've done something else, they're resident, they're source country, and they're all the kind of things that we know and love. Um, is that a good place to tax them? Well, we have all these problems of base erosion and profit shifting, we have problems of economic efficiencies, we have all kinds of problems. And... What I was advocating six years ago was actually, why don't we move towards a uh, place where we make sales, the market country. That is, on the similar grounds as the users are not going to move away, broadly your customers are not going to move away either. So if we can do that, um, we, you know, it's going to be best, better for economic efficiency, it's also going to be better for collecting revenue. And uh, you know, congratulations to the OECD, they're moving in that direction, was kind of so is the treasury really. We think of the users as being the kind of market country in a sense. Um, there is, they were clearly moving in that direction, which is certainly, we weren't anywhere close to in 2013. Um, I'll say something about Pillar 1 briefly. Um, pillar 1 is moving us towards, you know, where I say sales are. What about Pillar 2? Well, Pillar 2 is still a bit unclear, but if there's anything, it's actually, oops, I've gone rather too, oops, what have I done? Uh, sorry, I'm going to have to go all the way through again. Um, 
Right, pillar one is there, pillar two is there. So, so a kind of problem with the OECD proposals, sorry Richard, is you know, we've got all this mostly tax here, and we're going to you know, probably have pillar one in the market country, and we're going to have pillar two in the, in the headquarter parent company. And that's going to be pretty complicated, um, to say the least. Um, so pillar one, um, so I say allocate some profit to the market country, you know, I, I guess you know, there's lots of things that we could talk about this. You know, it's only part of the residual profit, so it's a pretty small element of the total profit. And I think, you know, as Richard said, one of the issues there is if we're going to tax something in the market country, we have to take it away from somewhere else, and that's the kind of big question that we've unresolved. One of the um, ideas that we think about in the book um, is something we call the residual profit allocation by income. What we are proposing there is we split profit into the residual profit and routine profit. We kind of build up from the bottom. We kind of figure out what routine profit is in a kind of relatively simple way. Uh, and then we have the residual profit on top of that, which we will allocate to uh, market countries. If you would like to know more about that, you can please ask questions. Um, so, uh, conclusion, um, I think there is a case for moving towards where users are and where cons customers are. So I think the kind of basic idea, this is a place where we can tax multinational profit, is true. Um, I, uh, um, I think that the, 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 the DST is probably not the best way of doing that, and, um, but I think, you know, we, at least that is now on the table, and I think that's a step forward from where we were six years ago. Thank you. Um, just, just to be clear, Mike, I mean, to what extent do you welcome the OECD's proposals of moving towards where you think we should be, and to what extent do you think actually they're not in the right place at all? I wasn't quite clear from you, what you were saying about the extent to which you really do think it's moving to the to, to, to the point of sale. Uh, uh, I would. Um so I would recognise all the problems that Richard has. He's got 135 members of the inclusive framework, you know, trying to get political agreement from all of them to say, okay, we're going to scrap everything we've got and move to a destination basis is unrealistic. Um, so moving step by step is more realistic. And you know, I don't think the OECD at the moment realise this, but I think they're taking the first tentative steps towards a, a much greater move to a destination base and taxing in the market country. And I think that because, you know, that's where you can tax. I mean, actually, it's quite hard to tax uh, not in the destination country because companies move away and they shift their profits somewhere else. <coughs> so I'd, I would say I kind of welcome the fact that there's a name on the agenda. Uh, I don't think they're moving as far as I would move, but politically and realistically, I think this is a step which in the right direction, and I think there'll be more steps. Will there be more steps, Richard? <laughs> um, this is not being approached on the basis that it's a staggered move to a destination system. Um, the intention of many of the delegates is that this is, uh, this is not a destination system at all. And uh, there is some uh, pressure on uh, nexus factors to try and make that clear. So that mere sales would not be enough. But, but uh, the obvious structure of the of the OECD approach is clearly to reward the market or user jurisdiction by reference to any of the three theories of the UK value contribution uh, based on user participation, the US, which is, is essentially a value creation based on marketing intangibles, and the Indian approach, or G24, I should say more correctly, the G24 approach, which basically moves away from that supply side analysis of allocation of taxing rights uh, and that will be more akin yeah. to uh, what Mike has in mind. So the world's moving in your direction, Mike. Well, I like think it is, yeah. yeah. It's taken a long time. It's a long way to go. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, we now have uh, just over half an hour for um, questions from, from you. Um, so if you could uh, indicate in the normal way, um, if you'd like to ask a question and obviously say who you are and where you're from before you do so. There are some roving mics to pick up your voice. Now, who would like to ask the first question or questions? It's one over here. Hi, I guess there's a question to Richard, really, or about anyone else who has a view can chip in. My name is George Turner, and I'm from a think tank called TaxWatch. And there's been a huge amount of focus on the digital service tax. 
uh, in the UK and other places. But the same day the Chancellor announced the DST here, he also announced another measure, which gets almost no coverage at all, which is targeted at the same people, and which, according to Treasury figures, would raise more money than the DST, at least in its early years of operation. And that is the extension of the income tax charge to royalties earned by non-resident companies from UK sourced income. I wish it had a pithier title than, or like a DST. And that can be done entirely within the current tax treaties. Um, in fact, some people think that actually the UK has the right to do this already and the legislation was unnecessary anyway. It was just confirming a position that already existed. And is that something the OECD has looked at uh, or has a view on or these kinds of actions that are alternatives to the DST that may not be as radical in terms of breaking with international tax principles but are possibly as effective in dealing with some of the structures that we've uh, been encountering? I suppose the question there is, is it an alternative? Is it as effective at achieving what the DST is supposed to achieve? Uh, I think it was directed to you in the yes, first Yes, sure. Day. So um, uh, the answer is that uh, certainly in the last few months, the focus has been on the fact that there have been three proposals made on digitalization, namely the US, UK, and uh, G24. And the effort has been to see to what extent they can be brought together, uh, which if, you, if you've been following it, you'll know that the Secretariat has made an effort to bring them together and in what's called the unified approach, which is now under discussion. So that's really been where the emphasis has been on. In terms of completely different mechanisms uh, to do that, then uh, there's not been time to do that. Um, or rather, or you can put that another way to say that um, everything that the OECD Secretariat has been trying to do is, is driven by consensus. And so with a, uh, the, the approach you suggest or you, you refer to uh, it is not is not an approach that's that, that's been supported in any significant way uh, to sort of qualify for that treatment of trying to get that so consensus basically. Anyone else like to respond to that? I mean, I, I think what I said the offshore receipts rules has actually been more of a pillar two type mechanism within the OECD. So I think an under it's more of an under tax payments type rule. I would say. So I think it is there in the OECD thinking. It's just not part of the question of the allocation of taxing rights. It's more of a question of sort of tidying up the, the remaining base erosion problems. Other questions? Offshore waters, I should say. <laughs> Stuart. Stuart Adam, IFS. Um, so I wanted to tie together two of the things that Richard and Ali were saying. So Richard was talking about the inevitable difficulties in getting consensus for the OECD proposals. Um, and Ali w was talking about um, essentially the, the unpopularity um, of DST. And I wonder whether one unintended consequence of DST is that it might be so unpopular among businesses that it helps to galvanise business support around the world for the OECD proposals as being at least they're better than DST. Ali, you're now, you're now much more in favour of OECD proposals than you otherwise would have been. Um, I think multinational businesses tend to reject sort of any unilateral action because um, you know, one of the challenges for business is the sheer number of tax regimes that you have to understand and work with. Um, and generally, you know, you're, you're not trying to evade or avoid. You want to pay tax once. So the more territories work together um, and the more cooperation across the globe, frankly, the better. Um, and I guess business has always been behind uh, the current OECD project to tax profit and tax profit once only. Um, the, the problems arise when the, the proposals are sometimes incredibly difficult to implement or unworkable or you have different territories interpreting those same proposals differently. 
um, with no dispute re uh, resolution mechanisms. You know, the, the mechanisms we have, for instance, the map process is already um, difficult to work with. The APA process can be very difficult to work with. So I think business would, would be happy to work with the OECD proposals if priority was given to dispute resolution, to cooperation. Um, anything unilateral is, is frankly just, just a pain and it's a very costly pain for business in order to implement. Would it be too cynical to suggest that business kind of really basically thinks that you know the chances of all these countries actually agreeing anything and therefore the OECD proposals really happening in the you know in the short term are not very great and therefore you know let's go against the DST and say we support the OECD with no real expectation if I'm being ever so cynical be actually happening. I, I think business fully believe that something has to happen. Uh, so I don't think sort of pushing back on the DST would particularly make business believe that, that nothing was going to end up happening. I think we all think that it's absolutely inevitable that if the OECD don't come up with something that we are going to get unilateral measures. So um, I think it would be a very, very optimistic organisation who believed that you could just keep your head below the radar and, and absolutely nothing would happen. And it's certainly not. Uh, well, uh, I realise now I should have uh, tried to give you a better answer about the timing. Uh, <laughs> and there is a serious point here. I mean, we will know whether, uh, where we are in 2020. I I'm sure of that. Uh, I, the reason I, I was a little coy in responding directly on the timing is because um, there's clearly going to be a stage, there's clearly a two stage approach here, which is. Uh, sketching out the sort of basic design or architecture, whatever you want to call it, of the regime as a whole. And then there's going to be quite a lot of detailed work uh, getting to a stage where that can be implemented. So, for example, uh, assuming that we have a business line segmentation approach, uh, you would think that next year uh, there would be agreement or some understanding about broadly what that would involve. But the detailed mechanics of, what, of, of how you'd apply that would be something that would be worked on in the the subsequent months, uh, maybe a couple of years. I, I don't know the exact time of that. I think that's harder to, uh, to, to say, but certainly uh, relatively short in, in the context of the international tax world. Uh, what I'm really pretty sure on is that we are going to see a resolution of this at a high level in 2020. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether how that's going to be choreographed through the year, whether there's going to be some initial agreement in January or maybe June, or whether we'll see that later in the year, but I'm, I'm certainly, uh, I'd be very surprised if we do not see resolution at that high level in 2020. With agreement from the loser nations in terms of tax, I mean, presumably getting the US on board is a challenge here. Yeah, everything is a challenge. <laughs> um, uh, there are, there's a whole range of, uh, and I, I I suspect my comments didn't bring it alive, but there's a whole range of technical challenges and practical challenges and political challenges. Uh, the scale of what's being attempted, for good or ill, is, is, is just colossal. If I could sort of come back on, on your point, that if the OECD can give us even a good steer in 2020 of what that segmental reporting could look like, then businesses can start to plan for that. And, and it, it does take a long time to change systems if, if you're looking at reporting lines that, that you don't currently have. But it's perfectly workable if you get a long enough run in to understand. You know, even if the fine detail hasn't been worked out, if you roughly know what's going to be expected of your reporting systems going forward, then you can start to plan for that and look at it. And, and that, that, you know, just even getting an indication of where it's going next year would be very useful. More useful than having a DST, which you change your systems for, and you then have to get rid of, and then you have to start all over again. I guess the challenge, in a way, is for um, nation states to, I mean, you know, why do we got DSTs? Well, you know, there's a problem, something needs to be done, here's something, let's do it. And the, um, uh, I guess the, the challenge for the nation state is, how do they, communicate to the world that the OECD, they're part of this OECD 
process which at some point will do something when they're under pressure now to do something. Well, and that explains the extreme ta time pressure at the OECD. I think the, unless it's changed, the UK position is this has got to be uh, resolved by, is it uh, March, April or something, 2020? It's going to be introduced in April 2020. 2020. Yeah. So, so, you know, yeah. not only is there at the OECD some pretty uh, significant challenges, but there's a massive time pressure as well. We have some other time pressures on our uh, policies at the moment. Can I ask a question? I mean, I don't know if anybody can answer this. It's a question to the Treasury, really, but I mean, the, the proposals that the OECD are considering are very different from the DST. And the, you know, the, the, the Treasury's position is we're going to introduce the DST unless the OECD come up with something acceptable. Um, and I, my question would be well, is Pillar 1 acceptable? Is Pillar 2 acceptable? Is the combination acceptable? Can anybody? Answer that question. I, I guess there's nobody here from the Treasury who's going to say anything. But, um, I don't know. <laughs> which is your idea that one? I'm not. I'm certainly not. I don't know if there's any. There was actually a meeting between some of my CIOT colleagues and the Treasury this afternoon, which unfortunately I couldn't attend. Okay. I haven't had any feedback, but I suspect again due to the current election climate, they didn't say too much. They were probably more in what they call listening mode. But if I do hear anything, I'll let you know, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> is, there any, is there anyone in, uh, in the audience who has a, has a sense of this? I mean, obviously not someone who's a current civil servant. We are, as ever, completely ignorant of what's going on <laughs> <in> the Treasury. <laughs> Which is exactly how they like it. Uh, uh, next question. Fuck yeah. Hi, uh, Andy Summers from uh, London School of Economics. Um, yeah, I'd just be interested to hear a bit more particularly from Ali about what you think is the ratio of administrative costs to the amount of tax that would actually be payable under the DST. Because as you pointed out, you know, HMRC estimate this would cost them eight million to administer. That's quite a large amount of money, um, to me at least, but not large in relation to the expected tax take really from the DST. So, I mean, in a, as a ballpark, could you give an indication of what sort of ratio you would expect in business between the cost of administering the DST versus the amount of tax you would actually pay under it? I mean, we certainly haven't done any or been able to do any calculations of, of tax because we are still grappling with are we in or out? Um, and it's really is that basic because every time we, we see something new come out it, it almost makes it more difficult to work out which aspects of your business are in. Um, the thing that we grapple with is we would generally have a lead time of about 18 months to change, to make any significant change to an ERP system. Um, and I know companies uh, with heads of tax that I talk to sometimes take two to three years to change to make any significant change. So if you are making those changes in, say, 15 territories or 35 territories, and Rich has got me really worried now, you know, coming up, that is a lot of business time just consumed in messing around with reporting systems that isn't generating any value for the business. <coughs> so I think that's the real cost for us. It's the, the lead time. And as we said, if this tax comes in in, in March, we're, we're going to be um, making a decision very soon at the end of the first year on whether we're in or out. I believe that decision has to come fairly quickly and then you have to return sometime later. They're asking us to report on something that we don't currently record. So, you know, really, if we, if we were going to start changing our systems for this tax to come in on the 1st of April, we, we need to know what it is now. Um, or we actually needed to know about a year ago, actually. Um, and and that's, that's the cost. So I don't have a feel on how much we'll pay or even if, in fact, we will pay anything. I know we'll have a lot of cost in determining whether we're due to pay anything or not or if we're in or out. Um, it's a bit like the diverted profits tax. You spend a huge amount of time and money working out that it doesn't apply to you. Um, but... You know, if, if you're talking about multiple territories, that's going to add up. Any other views on the panel on that one? I, I, I'm just sort of picking up on Ali's point. I think in our response to the, 
the latest DST consultation. I'm paraphrasing, but we described um, DST as a tax that was basically incalculable and then unauditable. Yeah. And therefore, possibly not an ideal tax. <laughs> <laughs> say that about corporation tax as a whole. Hello. Um, Phil Greenfield from PwC. Um, where do we fit into this picture of an increasing number of digital services taxes? Um, the potential removal of the World Trade Organization moratorium on the application of customs duties to digital services which we understand is potentially up for either renewal or removal, at least. Uh, that's a left field question for me, but I don't know if anyone on the panel has an answer to that. No. Um, no <laughs> I think we're collectively stumped. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can say that um, we spend a lot of time on customs duties on digital services. Um, I can't answer, but clarity would be fantastic because it's complex. It's a very complex area as it is. Um, and we already seem to spend a, a ridiculous amount of time debating it, particularly when your digital services are bundled services and you spend a lot of time bundling and debundling and trying to work out what an ask custom duty um, is. So I can't help. I'd love to know the answer. It's not a question to which you know the answer, is it? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, an easier question next time, please. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, there we go. Thank you. Uh, so it's Glenn Price from Vodafone. A question to, to Richard. Um, the, the Pillar One paper obviously targets far, a far wider scope of, of uh, business than uh, any of the, the, the DSTs sit to date. So you focus on consumer facing businesses. Was, was that decision based on any data that all consumer facing businesses should be targeted? Because everything in the DSTs has, has really focused on either digital companies or or those who are using their intangibles in a, in a specific way, so limited risk distributor models or marketing models. You, you're capturing thousands more companies than, than any other government has planned to. Was there data behind that? Uh, no. You, you've got to see... Well, not directly. I mean, you've, you've got to see it in the context of the discussion at the OECD over the last couple of years, which admittedly started... I mean, obviously started with digital, but then moved on to the wider, particularly following the interim reports, recognised the difficulties of trying to ring-fence the digital sector, and moved on to looking at a, in a wider way at the digitalisation of the economy. Um, so th th that trend had, had started long before any of the um, uh, effort, any, anything this year, for example, programme work and those kind of efforts. Uh, the other thing that I'd probably just repeat and probably fed up with me saying this is that uh, the efforts of the Secretariat to get a consensus are the efforts of the Secretariat to get a consensus. And um, trying to find a notion that people can uh, have a consensus around that, that, that does have some kind of um, way of being articulated. Um, whether you look at it as a principle or a, an approach, how, you know, however you look at that, that, that is quite important. You, so, so this is really all a function of trying to get a consensus. That, that for, for me, personally, is, is, the, is the big learning curve of having had a, a career in practice and, and then spending time with, with Mike in academia. The big thing for me in, in working at OECD is just understanding what that is the implications of that. Nothing can be done without consensus. But just, just some, can I follow that up? I, mean, I, I think in my mind the question is, so how, or what is the scope of this? I mean, it does sound, I mean, it's clearly very much broader than just digital. Well, it's broader. It's a, it, 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 I mean, and this is the subject of ongoing discussion. Obviously, we've got a consultation uh, process going on, and there's a, a very active process with delegates. 
so we may or may not be at the end of the road exactly where we are now, but as things stand, we are targeting consumer uh, business. Right. And that uh, consumer business, uh, the notion of consumers is something that is articulated in the law of many different states with things like consumer protection law and so on. So the number of precedents for the uh, definition has been a fairly extensive uh, amount of work done on what would be within the scope, what would be outside the scope, uh, where there may be some issues uh, of uh, businesses that might be within the scope that might, that might uh, that there might be warranted some carve out for policy reasons. So there's been behind the scenes, as it were, more discussion about what is involved in this. It does sound like quite a big step to your Nirvana, right? It's, I, this is, I think it's a, well, I, I think it's, I think it's a very big step, but I think it's capped in terms of it being not such a big step. I think, as, as kind of Richard said, this is, you know, I, I, I guess the question is, you know, we're going to allocate some taxing rights to the market country. And, and the question is, well, are we doing that because sales are there? That would be my step. Or are we doing that because we've discovered that value is created there? Which I think is the, is actually what kind of people within the OECD might be thinking. And well, I think that's very different different starting place and, and actually a different finishing place as well because it takes you to a different position in the end. Yeah. I was just hesitating yes. whether or not the people within the OECD Well, when I say the OECD, I mean people are part of the discussions and... Y yes, I mean, we're obviously we're all civil servants within the OECD, but, um, and I made reference to the fact that there are different interpretations of this. There's the US, you, you, yeah. in the UK, based more on value creation, and then there's obviously G24, which is not based on value creation at all. That's based on a basically uh, the, the supply side analysis of the allocation tax and rights doesn't make any sense in isolation. So there's a whole sure. broad span of views about why we're doing this. Um, and they support the consensus. So I'm trying to attribute views to the Secretariat. Excellent. <laughs> right, next. Hi, James Lyon from Mazars. Um, just ask a uh, question, really. Um, if we're going for a, a destination principle where the customer is and where the revenue is, why don't we use a tax that we've already got in VAT? <laughs> well, I think that's the. Can I answer that? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be astonished if you did. <laughs> I think it's a very good idea. Um, so, I'm going to actually kind of. The other proposal that we're making in the book is, is a version of, is, you could think of it as a version of VAT. So, v, I mean, think of VAT is a tax on value added. So, in accounting terms, value added is equal to profit plus wage income. So, if you take the VAT and you give relief for labour costs, you've actually got a tax on profit. And if you, you could administer, actually, you could administer it in exactly the same way as VAT, and you'd end up with a tax on profit located in the destination country. Or you could do it in various different ways. But I think that's the basic idea of that. I think is exactly where I'm going with, you know, in terms of the kind of destination. Um, so we call it a destination cash flow, destination based cash flow tax. So it also picks up you know, the Mead Committee from the 1970s that advocated the cash flow tax. And the kind of twist here is to give it the border adjustment that the VAT has. So uh, we don't tax exports, but we do tax imports. And that turns turns the cash flow tax to being, you know, tax on profits as a kind of source basis, kind of broadly defined to a destination basis. Um, so I, I think that's a very good idea, I agree with you. <laughs> so I, I, I have to admit, I'm a VAT specialist, so I'm a bit biased. Okay. <laughs> so can I just add that um, I think that idea makes plenty of sense if all countries have a VAT system or could get one, and would have no political barriers to getting one. That is not the case. I can't imagine which country you've got in mind. Paul, can I? Yes. I mean, I, I, I think it, my, my view is wherever we end up with the OECD, with both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, it's not the end, but it's actually, there's another debate then to come, which is, in a sense, why do we tax companies at all and how much tax do we want to take out of them? And yet, there's reasons for taxing companies. Well, one, they do use some level of services, but actually you probably don't need to raise a huge amount of tax out of them to pay for the services they use. Two, if you don't tax companies, then 
you know, certainly at the lower end of the scale, well, everybody disincorporates, or, sorry, everyone incorporates and trades through a company because they don't pay any tax rather than paying income tax. And the third is because actually it's a convenient place to take some tax out of. You know, companies generally do pay their taxes. And this is the Chris Sanger argument that we tax companies because they're there. And then you've got to sort of say, well, okay, what, are, what is corporation tax good for and who is it actually taxing? And you get into questions of incidents, which uh, Paul and Mike are much better at answering. But you know, if you are trying to tax the owners and the investors, then you then come down to the question, is corporation tax the way to do it? Or do you actually need a mix, much more of a mix currently than we've got at the moment, of taxes on, corp of corp taxes on profits and taxes on distributions to those investors? And I think that's the next debate. I mean, it may be that in 20 years' time, everybody thinks that a rate of corporation tax across the world of 10% is absolutely fine. But that's because that's seen as the right amount of tax to be taken out. And we're taxing owners, investors, others in other ways. Alternatively, you know, it could be 70%. I'm not going to... Uh, that's a debate we haven't yet had. Or we probably have. The people have, probably have had it in certain halls, but not widely enough. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think that's kind of interesting point about you know what people think of as the kind of reasonable rate of corporation tax. Because if we were sitting here 25 years ago, we'd have thought 20% was extraordinarily low. In fact, the ruling committee proposed a minimum tax rate of 30%. Um, what's happened? You know, you mentioned tax wars. We've we've, we've been in a tax war uh, for some decades, you know, which has pushed corporation tax rates down. So we now think 19, 20% seems reasonable and. You know, maybe in 10, 15 years' time, we'll think 10% is reasonable. I think it's a question of why we think it's reasonable is more important than just think just because it's, we've got there through competitive pressure. <laughs> I, I guess this is a more <laughs> difficult question. <though. laughs> and, and this is where politics really comes into yeah, this, yeah, this yeah, whole discussion. Yeah. Because, I mean, you know, why, why have we got a DST? Why, why is the Labour Party proposing significant increases in corporation tax? And so on. I mean, it's because, in a sense, the you know there is a disjuncture between this debate and the public um, perception of, uh, of of where we are in terms of taxation. As I say, I think that's a big challenge for you know, for all of the proposals that we're talking about. And I think if you ask the public, they would probably not think 20% is a reasonable, but without a great deal of understanding, they think the high you get the better. Can I come back? Yes. So I mean. The I mean, I think it's tight. I mean, as been said, I mean, if we're thinking, you know, if you actually think of corporation tax as being some kind of proxy for personal income tax, so, you know, individuals, it's a form of saving, you know, the profit is a form of return to saving, we should be taxing the profit in the company because we're not doing very well at taxing at the individual level, um, then you might start thinking about income tax rates on, on the return to saving. The problem with that is that actually corporation tax and personal income tax are taxed in completely different ways. You know, broadly, we tax worldwide returns to savings, um, but we tax corporation tax in the place where you're actually doing some business. And so, actually, corporation tax is really a very bad proxy for personal income taxes, at least, at least for that reason. Well, we're getting into but that's fairly, <laughs> fairly broad issues here. I think, inevitably, given the, the topic, we've got a couple of minutes left. Are there any final, um, are there any final questions? I'm Andrew Lane, I'm Phil, Phil, Phil Fisher. We, all governments like extra tax base, but if we accept we're in a world where basically all profits get taxed once somewhere, then we can't really increase our tax base without decreasing it somewhere else. So my question, I guess, is are we going to win or lose out of this? Because we have a lot of customers in the UK consuming digital products here. We also have a lot of companies in the UK selling their digital products elsewhere. So are we going to be getting more revenues here, or we can lose revenues because they're being paid somewhere else? It's very interesting. We always assume we'd win, but uh, would we like? Mm. Well, I think it depends exactly which tax system we're talking about. I mean, if we moved, if we moved from kind of where we are now to a kind of like a pure destination-based tax, where it would be like the VAT argument, where we're not taxing exports but we are taxing imports, 
and I think you know other things being equal, it would depend on the balance of trade. You know, is exports bigger than imports or not? And, you know, but there are, that's not the only real factor. I mean, it depends what else you're going to do within the tax system. On the DST itself, I mean, if you actually said we we're really going to take much more seriously where value is created and do more than the DST, I think that could lead you into all kinds of <coughs> taxes. Um, so I think it's very difficult to to answer that. Really, it depends exactly what the tax system is that you're. Well, to put it in concrete terms, I mean, the, the, the t main target of these measures seems to be the U.S. companies. So is the US going to lose out to the, to the benefit of other countries in the world? Or is it just moving deck chairs around on, on the surface of the ship and they'll just be in slightly different places and the, and the total tax take will be the same, just in different places? Well, I think it does bring us back to where we started in, the, in the, the kind of, and I think the kind of broad consensus of the BITS project was to say actually you know, some profit is not being taxed anywhere and so everybody can agree it would be good if it was taxed somewhere. And I think we are moving to that position now where you know, it's actually much more kind of fight over who gets the revenue. Um, so I think these, I think this issue is much more important than it was when we started the Bench Project five, six years ago. Um, I mean, in the context of the US, then, you know, the US has had a big tax reform since then. It's introduced, you know, minimum taxes worldwide, from guilty provisions, all kinds of things going on there, which, you know, make that question quite difficult to answer, I'm afraid, in certainly in a couple of minutes. It's presumably what makes your life difficult, Richard. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the many things, but probably the uh, most dramatic thing. Um, we, we're pretty much at the end. Now, did, did, did each of you want to come back with a final thought, Glyn? Final thought. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I, I would just reiterate what I just said. I think wherever, I think DSTs are not the end. I mean, DSTs are clearly supposed to be temporary, and I really hope they are temporary will be very interesting to see if the OECD proposals come to fruition and then in the UK the estimate for the OECD proposals in terms of tax revenue is lower than the DST. It'll be very interesting to see what the Treasury does there. I think that'll, I'll leave that as my final thought. Ali. Um, I suppose one of the things we've got to think about here is the companies that we're proposing to tax are your most um, agile and innovative companies. And the one thing we do know is that the, the landscape is not going to look the same in five years' time and possibly not three years' time. So I think it's important that what we do decide to do has some longevity um, because tech companies are very good at innovating and transforming. I think it's really important that we sort of go back to first principles here and say, you know, what what can we do that, that makes sense and, and it will last? Because the last thing you want to do is spend a lot of time and effort on something and your your target companies, as it were, just immediately transform and change their business models. And, and they're very, very good at that. Richard? Uh, I probably said enough about... Um the theme I was trying to make about the challenges that uh, the wider challenges that are the context in which we should think about DSTs and, uh, and, the, and I guess I'm making the point that we need to be realistic about the trade-offs and the changes that that will bring to us for any possible solution. Um, I would point to other things about the tax system. I mean, the, the entire debate at the moment is about you know, either you know, is there more revenue to be got either here or anywhere else and the whole thing is about kind of the revenue and the allocation of revenue but you know, we, we need to think about complexity, uncertainty, economic efficiency, all the kind of things where taxes have a kind of disproportionate effect on business and affect what businesses do. Um, all of those kind of issues, <coughs> it's not that they're kind of being forgotten entirely but that's not really the focus of what the debate is at the moment. I think you know, we need to remember all those kind of issues as well as when we're thinking about revenues. Great. Well, thank you all. I guess um, in, in uh, is it about four weeks' time, we'll know a bit more about the likely direction of many things, not least um, tax policy uh, in this country. And I'm sure that uh, both Mr. McDonnell and Mr. Javid are thinking very hard about this right now, <laughs> as they get questioned in hustings around the country on the details of this particular, particular tax. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you all very much indeed. I mean, I, I certainly learned an enormous amount um, this evening. 
Nietzsche, given where I started, it wasn't hard. But um, thank you, that really was very uh, interesting indeed. And thank you all for coming along. There are drinks um, just outside the door.